back to that. But the next speaker is Adam Arrowworth. He uh, is a uh, senior horticulturalist at uh, First and Bosch Botanical Garden in Cape Town. And uh, he will be talking tonight about a region of the Muckleland called the Nerds Lockbeat. Adam, are you here? <laughs> oh, okay. Adam, please welcome Adam Harrowitz. Thank you for having us. This is a great privilege to be here. Um, <clears throat> I realize we're running a little bit late, so we've tried to cram in two long talks into one short evening, and we've had some hits. So forgive me, I'm going to try and uh, Fast forward my way through this presentation so we don't get home too late too much. But I just wanted to start by saying a huge thank you um, for, for having us here this evening. It's a really a tremendous privilege for Carl. This is his first uh, time in the United States. Uh, my wife is actually Californian. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm the true African. <laughs> so we live in Cape Town in South Africa. But I just wanted to thank Stephen very much for inviting us to be here. We're doing a lot of behind the scenes organizing with our itinerary and flights. Uh, and his wife, Linda, so kindly, uh, he and his wife, Linda, so kindly hosted us. Um, we just had the most wonderful time seeing cacti in, in nature, which is cacti for us in nature are usually alien invasive plants, which we're trying to eradicate. So to see a cacti in their natural habitat is just amazing. Aren't they the most incredible plants? Um, also, just a big thank you to uh, Paniyoli Kalaidi, the chairman of the North American Rock Art Society, who organized things for Get Side. We don't do the speech to it, so we've, we've been back to back. So, you know, forgive my voice, it's also been failing me a little because we were speaking last night and uh, <clears throat> it's giving up. So, bear with me. Um, I'm going to take you on a, a whirlwind, a roller coaster tour of, I think, what's my favorite place in the whole world. And one of the most botanically interesting places is a place called the Knapsflakke, where everything is miniature, everything is dwarf. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I am a horticulturist at, at Kirstenbosch National Botanical Gardens in Cape Town, We're managed by the South African National Biodiversity Institute. That's a mouthful. Uh, but Kirstenbosch is, uh, is, is well known. Many of you probably have heard of it, but some of you may even have visited it. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> the laser pointer works. <laughs> is there an on off? Yeah, it is on. Compare the human to the really small stuff you need a computer. Uh, as a game. What? As a game. It's a game. Escape? <laughs> no, it would give you a different name. Okay, you might just have to. Do you want to use the arrow? Okay, you, you may just have to advance the slide. I don't know. <clears throat> so, if for those of you who don't know where Cape Town is, it's based at the very tip of the African continent. Right down the southwestern corner, uh, that's where Kirstenbosch is based, that's where I live. And the, uh, the climate in the southwestern Cape is Mediterranean, pretty much like the central southern coast of California, uh, on the west coast of the United States. It's Mediterranean, we get all of our rain in winter and summer's dry. Oh, see, no, you want to do it, Stephen, sorry. I, th I think we might be here all night if, <laughs> if we don't get this work. I don't know how you know how you got it working last time. It just started in. But put it up right next to it. Oh, this is a sick. So the area Carl was talking about was um, this area here, which is the, the Richter's Felt. And the area of the macron that I'm going to talk to you about is over here, and that is called the Knausflakte. Now, the name Knausflakte is 
derived from the word knas, which means in Afrikaans to it's like gnashing of teeth, and it's, uh, it's like a grinding sound. And we think it, the, the, the area got its name when the original ox wagons were trekking north over these quartzitic uh, fields, and the sound of the ox wagon wheels crushing the quartz pebbles uh, <coughs> caused a, a grinding sound. And so it's, uh, it's got, it says, and flutter means plain, so it's the grinding plain. All right, I'll tell you a little bit about Kirstenbosch. This is where I work. Kirstenbosch National Botanical Gardens is 110 years old. Oh, it's working now. Well, I'm crazy, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's the first botanical garden in the world to focus exclusively on indigenous native plants. It's a garden of all seasons, working on Thank you. It's a garden for all seasons. It has it's, it's wonderful in winter, it's wonderful in summer, and, and it's probably at its most spectacular in, in late winter and spring. So the aloes flower in midwinter, and in springtime we have these um, rice displays of Chrysanthemum, Lampranthus. <laughs> and if you have to leave it on. There you can see the uh, Lampranthus, with this Chrysanthemum, situated on the eastern slopes of Table Mountain. And it's an area that receives a really high rainfall. In fact, despite it being med Mediterranean, we get between uh, 40 and 60 inches of rain a year. So it makes it really challenging for me as the horticulturist who have to grow succulents. So we keep most of our succulents in a conservatory and in greenhouses. But there are a few like these big euphorbias uh, and some of the aloes which we can actually grow outdoors. So the annual spring displays of wildflowers are really a highlight and the garden is situated up the hill. So you get these great views out over the city of Cape Town. Okay, so the garden is, as mentioned, it's uh, focused on native plants, particularly the plant groups, Restios, um, Ericas, there's another Restio, this is Woody Iris called Mybenia, Proteas, of course, our national flower, and uh, there's no shortage of species to focus on. The Western Cape has a, a part of it that forms the Cape Floristic region, going to my the Cape Floral Kingdom, which has about nine and a half thousand plant species. And just on Table Mountain alone, uh, there are over two and a half thousand plant species. About, I think, probably about half of those are endemic to the area. Okay, it's working, Stephen. So we're very blessed with our own water. It comes off the mountain, and we use this water. We damage and we irrigate the garden. So it's a it's a wet area. We've recently built a tree canopy walkway, so it's a beautiful thing for the tourists to see and you know, for them to get up into the treetops and to enjoy the garden from a height. Okay, right. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Knash Flutter. What if you took a rainforest that received perhaps uh, 200 inches of rain per year and you reduced it by, say, 50 times to approximately 4 inches of rain per year? And then you spread the ground with brilliant white quartz petals and thus doubling the light intensity. Effectively, you reduce the need for anything to grow up. There's so much light, nothing needs to reach for the sun at all. So you end up with an environment that looks a little bit like this. It's a, it's a treeless environment. In fact, even the, even the shrubs that walk. And the vast majority of the plants, I the only way to describe them on miniature, they are dwarfed. And many of them are hidden. They barely uh, emerge above the pebbles in which they grow. That's the area I'm talking about here, highlighted in, in the lavender color. The, uh, Carl was talking about this area up at the top here, that the rift itself, this forms part of the Great and the Macroland region. It's still part of the winter rainfall zone, which is effectively this line here, everything to the right gets summer rainfall. Um, the area is approximately 4,000 square miles, and it stretches, for those of you familiar with uh, South Africa, but it's contained in the north, here's our national freeway, the N7, which goes all the way to Namibia. But it's contained all the way to the coast, down to this area, the strand contained Clara, and the dogs on rainstorm uh, in the south. And on the eastern side, it's bounded by this mountain range called the Hunter Mountain Range. 
So if any of you have traveled on the N7, you'll be familiar with this view. And at, uh, say, 80 miles an hour, you might be forgiven for thinking it's fairly drab, pretty dull, nothing particularly spectacular to look at. But little do most people know of the wonder they're driving to. It seems barren, it seems dull, it seems lifeless. But when you get closer, it's tremendously rich. Now, this escarpment that I mentioned is this is on the eastern side of the Nassau, it's called the Huntsum Plateau. You can see these hard sandstone edges which have effectively eroded away and deposited. Uh, the sandstone has, has disintegrated and grown and left the hard quartz like pebbles behind. And that's effectively what's been deposited through alluvial action down on the plain. And you can see the reflective qualities of the, of the quartz as it, as it reflects the sun's intensity. That's looking kind of southwest, and that's in the middle of winter. You can see nice lush, nice lush green. And there you can just see a glimpse of Van Rains Pass, which is the famous mountain pass that takes you up on top of this plateau. But it's not always like that. It goes through periods of drought from time to time. And in the late 20, so 2015 to 2018, we experienced a severe drought for a number of years where there was precious little rain at all. This poor farmer. I think was hoping to get some kind of crop out of this field, but nothing at all. But it's often happens in really extreme environments to get the most extraordinary creatures and adaptations for survival. So at first glance, you would look at this and you'd think, well, there's really nothing there. But if you start looking a little bit closer, you see that, in fact, half the pebbles uh, on the ground, in fact, not pebbles at all, but they're actually living stones. So you can see all the these wonderful little, they're called the silver skin, the argyrodermis. And this is this genus of plants from the medicine family, the Fates, the Azoaceae, and it's a family, a genus of plants that's endemic to the Nassau. And you can see how beautifully they mimic the, the, the stone pebbles around. Now, the silver skin is not just there for camouflage, it's there, it serves a function that protects the heat. The temperatures in the Knesset Flutter um, can get pretty warm, up to about 95 Fahrenheit. Uh, not that, not as hot as the northern Arctic Shelf, but it can get hot enough. And so the quartz reflects the heat, and so does the often the uh, silver or very pale coloration. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, species that occur here. Argyroderma thistle is probably the most widespread species in the Knesset Flutter. The stunning plant in nature is a stunning plant to grow with these beautiful finger like leaves. Widespread and often dominate the landscape. And if you're lucky, you see this yellow form, which is quite unusual and occurs close towards the coast. Agroderma crater reforming, aptly named for its crater like leaf arrangement. <clears throat> Possibly the largest headed of all of the Agroderma species. You can also see in this photo the capsules, the seed capsules will be forming, and each of those will, of course, hold many hundreds of seeds. And those will be held within the plant until the following autumn when the rains arrive and it will wash the seeds out. One of the smaller species, and one of my favorites, is Agrogenum frenzy, and these are two of the subspecies. And uh, this, this one here, Hawley, was named after Harry Hall. Uh, who's even traveled with in uh, South Africa. He's since passed away, but he was my predecessor, Kirsten Rochner, curator of the Flutter Collection. Isn't that just wow? Um, that's, you see a field of these in mind going, I mean, you see the leaves. Agroderma patent, and so does courtesy of, of Ernst van Jarsel, my also one of my former uh, colleagues and uh, curator of the succulent collection. There are actually there's many species, and the taxonomy of, of uh, Agroderma is, is quite a mess. And it's quite, well, I wouldn't say it's a mess, it's difficult to understand sometimes what you're looking at, uh, because often two or three species can grow together, and they can be hard to tell apart. Agroderma testiculare, and perhaps you can guess why it's called that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite appropriate. Its leaves are always uh, well raised above the ground, and um, 
sometimes you are lucky to see among them other living stones. And you see the, the toad grasshopper. So they are extremely well camouflaged, just like the, the plants in which they live, amongst which they live. So uh, even the eyes are white. And these things are amazing. They, they, you see them flying, they've got bright red wings. And then as they land, they just and they just where did you go? Incredible. Hargrid over stuff. Oldham, this curves it occurs closer towards the coast. Uh, the leaves are tightly clamped shut. The mouth of the fiercely held shut until the, 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 the flowers arrive and that forces the leaves apart. And unusually for Hargrid over, this one occurs on the black rock, a can of black rock, um, which is significantly warmer. Obviously, than the, the white pebbles. In fact, there was a study done um, by Peter mm -hmm. Schmiegel, and they found that the um, temperature of the the air temperature on a, on a really hot summer's day can be up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, which I say 50 degrees, 50 degrees Fahrenheit cooler on the quartz than, than on the surrounding vegetation. So it's amazing that the, the effect that this rock has on the air these plants don't seem to mind, and neither does this toad cricket over here. I'm not sure if it's the same species, it must be closely related, but it's just as hard to spot. Algorithm congregatum, uh, obviously named because it congregates in multi headed clusters, and sometimes they are immensely dense, and uh, it's impossible to put your foot down without standing. It's often walk as the plant is exposed. Algorithm delayed is possibly the, the species most widely cultivated, and it is very widespread on the peninsula. It's a beautiful thing, uh, and when it's in full flower, it can uh, really be the most showy of plants. <laughs> you can see it uh, flowering at a time of the year when there's not a lot of rain, and it's, so therefore it's not competing with the annual spring flowers. And it's, uh, so it's a, I have to throw these in, it's the stones that come alive. What better than the stones and flowers? But they don't always come in pink, they come in a variety of other colors as well. And in some places, they can be multicolored. So that's all the same species. There's a close up of the yellow form. And that's a, this is a, these were all photographs at the same uh, location. There's some theories about possible hybridizing going on, natural hybridization, but it's really, very, very difficult to explain uh, this sort of thing, but one just has to enjoy it. Agrodoma CRT, named after Major Yanni Piat from the Army, who is now a bookseller in Cape Town and uh, brought many wonderful books to Kirsten Bosch for sale, and Erin Swanyasov described the species as named it after him. I think he was the one that discovered it. This one is unique because of these huge seed pods. And again, each one of those probably holding over 200 seeds. Often onlookers, you have your head buried in the quartz and you look up and you find there's, <laughs> there's things watching you. Now, grazing is a part of the transplant, but there's many farms in that area. Uh, it's part of the livelihood of the people that live there. We work. With, uh, at Sandby, with the farmers, and we try and educate them on how to best manage their land without overgrazing. Sadly, in the past, there has been tremendous overgrazing, and sadly, you can see that the roots of these animals can do tremendous damage to the to this very, very delicate environment. But um, fortunately, much of the land is now being bought up by Cape Nature and been turned into a nature reserve for the kind of nature reserve. Now, the, the ecology of the land is, is quite subtle. And the low-lying areas are often quite saline. The, the hills, which are often not very big, um, have unique uh, suites of vegetation on them, depending on whether you're on the northern hot side, which is in the south, uh, southern hemisphere, the northern side of the hill is our sunny side, the southern side is the cool side. And uh, each aspect of the hill will harbor different species of plants, as I'm sure you're familiar with uh, here in the northern hemisphere. Um, now, when it's pouring with rain in Cape Town, it's not pouring with 
rain here, it's often just overcast and foggy. The rainfall is, um, just to remember, inches. It's about four inches, four and a half inches of rain per annum. The minimum temperatures are between, uh, so in the middle of in, in the very coldest temperatures now, I'm remembering the Fahrenheit is between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And in some of the very hottest temperatures are between uh, 85 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The whole area is between um, 300 and 900 feet above sea level. So I hope that's all making sense. It, it receives very little frost. So very seldom the temperature drops below zero. Now, in the hot, dry summer months, why do these plants survive? Well, many of them just disappear. Again, looking at this, you think there was nothing there. Until you start looking more closely, and you see, in fact, there are many plants that have actually just sunk deep into the soil and hidden themselves completely from the half summer sun. This is courtesy of the vegetation map of South Africa. And maybe just give you a little idea the average mean, uh, average precipitations is four and four and a half inches of rain per annum. The mean average temperature is only 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's average temperature through summer and winter. And the mean frost days are three. So it really it very seldom receives frost. And if it does, it's only for perhaps an hour or two. Uh, the rainfall falls in the middle of the year for us, which is our winter. That's May, June, July, August, September. Of course, that's when the temperatures are at the lowest. And these are the minimum temperatures here and the maximum temperatures here. Now, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice right now? <laughs> but in the nutshell, it's exactly how many of the plants survive. And it's quite an interesting phenomenon where the stones, these white pebbles reflect the sun's heat during the day, and they remain relatively cool. And at night, the stones cool down. If you get a, a, a moist fog that moves in from the ocean, and the humidity rises, these stones act a little bit like bear clumps. The moisture condenses on the stones, and it trickles down into the soil. It doesn't penetrate very deeply, perhaps an inch at most, perhaps only half an inch, into the, the surface soil. But that's all the moisture that these plants need to provide. So many of the species that occur in the natural flood very, very shallow root systems, and they make rapid, take rapid advantage of this immediate availability of moisture, which often that gets burnt off the next day. So in a study um, done in 2012, my colleagues looked at this, uh, they did some very fancy uh, soil analysis, they scaled, and they measured it over quite a long period, and they found in that particular year that there was a total annual rainfall of 142 millimeters, five and a half inches, so slightly <laughs> higher than the, than the average rainfall, but they also found that there was a, a total of five and a half inches of non-rain. So this is quite astonishing, actually, because if you, so of that five and a half of inches, 57% of that was due to fog, 41% was due to water vapor adsorption, which is this process here with, with the condensation, and 2% due. So the, the take home of this is that Roughly half of the moisture entering the soil in the that is not from rainfall at all, but from these, this, this condensation from these quartz pebbles penetrating into the soil. And if you turn over a, a rock, uh, a quartz pebble, you'll see that often there's algae growing on the underside of the rock. So underneath this rock, but there's not only enough moisture um, to support life uh, underneath the rock, but there's enough light penetrating through the rock to support life. And if you look carefully over here, you'll see there's a stone palm, there's an agroderma, and there's a little seedling. And although this <coughs> habitat looks barren, and um, should, we, should we save the questions for afterwards? Yeah, I think because we're running away. So, uh, because the, it appears to us as tall humans that it's a barren and harsh and extremely bright landscape, but for a plant that size, it's actually fairly shady. Now you make yourself the size of one of those little uh, germinating mesen seedlings, and you, you're looking between boulders, practically. So it's, a, it's an interesting uh, environment when you look at it from their perspective. All right, a few other interesting species from the area. Antimima is a wonderful genus. It's one of my favorites. I'm really getting into them. I know some of you grow them as well. Uh, this is a favorite from the Knaus flock, because Duales, and just to compare how it looks in summer and winter. 
Atlanta. Another treasure is this thing called Antimama Evoluta, erupting in flower and looking a little bit like a conchitis in a growth habit. There's another picture of the outer stem, the outer stripes, just coming into flower. Antimama Fenestrata. So many of these look much like alpine. They don't occur on mountain tops, but they often have to survive the same sort of thing. Not necessarily temperature, but howling winds and harsh conditions. And so that growth form of a cushion plant is very useful. And one of the joys of doing field work, uh, which I love doing in part of my job, is we often describe it as a fine new species. And this is a species of Antimima which we found just last year. So this is super exciting. I've only got one photo of it. And that's the rather miserable photo of this woman white flower, which is also quite unusual for plant survival. So we need to do more research on this one. Another extremely curious plant is a finger and thumb plant. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Dactylopsis, the uh, dactyl finger. And little woody is this species. <laughs> and its cousin, its larger cousin, is Dactylopsis digitata. So, so, so Really, a very appropriate name for that plant. Although now I think it's been dumped with the embryo, but I'm still sticking with the old name, Dactylopsis. But what I find uh, absolutely astonishing is when you look down here at this little fellow beneath, it's actually not a Dactylopsis that's started at all, but in fact, Balbini Dactylopsis soybean, which looks so very strange. Isn't it amazing? This plant only occurs with this plant, and yet they're completely unrelated. I think sometimes when you know when God is deciding what to put where, He He creates these little botanical uh, conundrums or red herrings for botanists to discover and puzzle over to essentially become. I, I I can't explain it, but it's one of those just complete miracles of nature. That is about winding that to soils as it's emerging out of the soil and it's in, in flower. And in very dry years, when it's not looking so big and plump, it only produces a single leaf, and it looks like little eggs nested with soft, gray eggs nested on the floor surface. Uh, window patterning and, and, and uh, fenestration on uh, leaf surfaces is common in many different parts. Many of you will know the word here, which stops the same thing. Uh, fenestraria, which Carl showed in his photo. Uh, takes with that effectively the tip of the leaf, which forms a window allowing light to penetrate. So, photosynthesis is happening deep down in the plant, and this plant is no exception. Balbini phallic, and a number of the Balbini do this. They have this amazing uh, fat thick leaf, but the light penetrates through the photosynthesis that actually takes place in the back of the leaf, so the top of the leaf is completely clear. Another one that does that is, is this thing, aptly named Balbini Hawertia, or it looks just like a Hawertia. And then another one that is very similar but actually quite difficult is now to be a picture of the word the oily in my fuzzy form. Is this a curious thing called Viney Margarita, which only occurs in Solomon's limestone? Again, adopting this, this curious windowing pattern. Well, Viney Lowy, close up of the leaves. It's just an explosion on the nest like the of Balbini species. I think there must be. Possibly 15 uh, or more species. And some of them are undescribed, including this one. Uh, I don't have a name for it yet. Uh, and yeah, it's another, another thing on, on my to do list. <laughs> but it's, it's really a, it's a delight to discover new plants. That's part of my job. Now, one of the, I think, the most spectacular is this gorgeous little thing described by Stephen Hammer, who some of you may know, this is San Diego. This, in fact, was photographed in his nursery because we didn't have this plant uh, in cultivation anywhere else. It was the locality was, in fact, lost. Nobody knew where it grew. I think John Granis had discovered it. And so uh, that was photographed many years. That was the only photo I had of it. Until a couple of years ago, we were doing some field work, and I sat down on a rocky outcrop to eat some sandwiches, and there between my feet was Bob Viney Lolita. Uh, so just a, an exquisite little plant. Tragically, though, six months after I found it, the poachers then found it and dug up about 5,000 plants, which fortunately were intercepted by the police and brought to me a cursor motion. 
So now they are growing happily and we are keeping them alive. And potentially we can replant them back in this nature at some point. <clears throat> this is the same species that Carl showed, these embryanthemoides. And sometimes they grow with other window plants like lithops. The only lithops on the nest like this, lithops divergence. Uh, and it's just amazing to see two different species of window plants coexisting. Conophytum. I love conophytum. They've been a favorite group of mine for uh, over 25 years. I've been growing them. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, you know, few words can describe the beauty, but just astonishing architecture. Uh, this is conophytum calculus. And there again, comparison between winter and summer. Sometimes you've got to be careful because you might just get bitten by a horned adder. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of wildlife on that nest like that. There are a number of interesting reptiles, including this one. So they are extremely well camouflaged and really poisonous. So you should put in mind your step. Gonna find them by Newton. Uh, why the name's not there, sorry, but this is the varying forms of conophyton by Newton. Um, I'm puzzled by all of this, but one of my favorites is this one, my Newton Bar Newton. It has this fantastic purple coloration. And fortunately, not poached. I'm going to my Newton Bar Pearson I, named after my, my first director of the National Botanical Garden, uh, Henry Pearson. You before me, meaning uh, like an egg, I'm going to move it for me. Wonderful pattern with full sun and sometimes deep shady crevices. Some fenestratum, uh, meaning uh, fenestra, fenestra, meaning window, and sub meaning below, and it's the window below. And these plants very seldom come above the soil and often are so well camouflaged you can barely see them. Like, yeah, you might, you might be able to spot one, two, three, four plants. Well, uh, there are. 37 plants. <laughs> That's an agoroderma. <laughs> so this is kind of five and stuff in Australia. It's, um, I got tired of trying to point them out to people. So I thought I'm just going to put a slide in the ring. I was doing this on the plane. No <laughs> Some of you may know Peter Brains. Professor Peter Brains has written on two wonderful, there's many wonderful books, but there are two on, uh, one on, on Sophilias and one on Euphorbias. And this uh, species is named as this one in endemic and flowering in spring. Most of the conifers flower in autumn. The smallest species on the class of the conifers is cutum. Absolutely tiny. So that's the, that's the big one. There's the small one there. Almost impossible to spot. You see the comparison to the and do it absolutely tiny. Very cute, they are shaped a little bit like a bowling pin, and, and the most of the plants actually submerge under the soil. When we were doing field work, we were contacted by the police and said, Be careful, there's poachers. We said, Thank you very much. Tell us where they are, and we'll go somewhere else. They said, No, come. I said, I'm not, like, I'm not here to catch any photos. I'm, I'm here to monitor critically endangered farms. Conifers and accused is only known from a single locality. And on this farm, uh, these are the police, and they were busy scouting and monitoring a team of poachers who were busy pulling out um, plants. So they apprehended the poachers, rounded them up, frog marched them off. That's a policeman holding a, a firearm there. And um, they were, of course, in ditch there. Bag in which they were keeping all the plants, but when you have a close look, there were over four and a half thousand conifers in Cuba, which was double the number of plants we ever thought even existed in the wild. Stephen has probably looked for more than anybody on earth, and uh, I don't know, Stephen, rough estimation of population size, in your opinion? Small. Small. So it, turns, it, it turns out that the project has actually found a new population. But in the process, like that. So we took them off to the uh, police station. I gave them a lecture and explained the importance of conservation and not destroying nature. Many of them have no idea what they're doing. Uh, they've been sort of ghosted into doing this as they were, as Carl mentioned. It. They are absolutely oblivious of the damage that they're doing, even the names of the farm that they're poaching. So, you know, one can feel sorry for these people, it's just confined to 
example. But there are the ringleaders, like this fellow here, Diego, who's notorious. He's the one who's the, 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 the ringleader of this lot. He's been fought four times. So, anyway, at least the people are trying to apprehend Carl is shouts, doing a tremendous job. I've just got to give a huge shout out to the commander here of the stock theft unit. He's arrested how many? Over 500 poachers. And uh, really, I call him the sheriff of the Wild West. He's an unsung hero. This guy works day and night and gets really very little recognition. He has done a tremendous job raising awareness about poaching and uh, mitigating further damage to our environment. But anyway, we do our best. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but many of those plants, well, the plants that are get, get seed get brought to us in first response. So there was a question earlier in the we care for those plants. We then also distribute them to other secure facilities so they're not all kept in one place. Uh, they get kept various uh, specialized nurseries around the country where they're cared for. And where possible, we actually do rehabilitate and plant them back into nature. But it can be very difficult because on two occasions where we've done that, um, the poachers have subsequently come back and dug them up again. So, um, so it's really frustrating. Also, the challenges of taking a nursery grown plant and sticking it back into the harsh desert environment, you know, it's pretty much a desert. So, what we're going to do is uh, pollinate these plants in, in ex situ collections, produce seed, potentially a critically endangered species. We'll use that seed to grow plants back. Ooh, quite a I think that's going to be one of the coolest plant names. <laughs> Only for me, meaning like an egg. And this is it erupting in autumn after a little bit of autumn rain. And as it progresses, it gets bigger and bigger. And that's what it does when it explodes in flower. Socially related species will fight with nanum. Nanum meaning small, just to see a place that just, just, just uh, yeah, insanely dense. One of the tiniest succulents, and possibly one of the strangest, is this uh, jelly baby called Diplosoma lucopi. And you can see the strange uh, base of it. Well, it's not so strange, but it's strange the way it behaves, because when this goes dormant, these leaves completely shrivel away and it turns into a little hard, woody stem, if you like, that can sit dormant for a long time. And then when it gets water, it produces new leaves again. So it's almost like a Almost like a deciduous tree, but but like only a fraction of an inch high. It's really strange. Even the seed capsule glistens with water cells on the surface. Sometimes you like to spot the spiny agama lizard, that's the male on the left, the female on the right. Hello to the hello lovers amongst you, hello Propoliana. Hard to spot, out of flower, and much like hello Goni, hello Merigata. <coughs> Exceptionally well camouflaged with the spots on the leaves, but in flower sticks out like a sore thumb. Always makes a terrific show. One of the best camouflaged species of all is this very strange Anacamsros. It's a very apt name, Anacamsros lanuginosa, which means um, like wool, I think. Lanuginosa meaning woolly, which is very appropriate. But you can see it adopts two survival strategies one is a, a geophyte and one is a succulent. And of course, the white uh, fluff on top is a uh, reflective method, like the sunscreen. Spring flowers can be spectacular, uh, and the backdrops are always wonderful. You find an old man in ruin. Oops. The mesons on the coast are just stunning, especially when you move off the ports and the sands are a bit deeper. Uh, these are spring annuals, the seniors mixed with black Francis or sand. And this is a wonderful uh, spring flower, basically, mesum called Dorothy Anthus Rolpia. Absolutely impossible to grow. I don't know anyone who's managed to germinate the seed, but a uh, shocking crimson red flower, just a treat. If you're lucky, you might spot a word there, but now spot as well. Very few who work in fact, in Macrolac, but this is one with the paraphernalia subspecies, number 20. Some of the crassulas, crassula family of stone crops, Thylacode on Pierce and I. These go deciduous in summer, so they lose their leaves entirely. Thylacode on Pigmaz, which is like it's been sprinkled with sugar. 
Isn't that a bizarre plant? I've never seen it in nature. This is the only plant I have growing in a pot at Kirsten Marshall. I thought I had to do it. Named after Matt Opal. Matt Opal from the CSSA. I think he lives on the East Coast. He discovered it. Old Tay. There's a flower. Which, unlike Thylacodon paniculatus, the Carl showed earlier, always flowers and half of its leaf. <laughs> Isn't creation fabulous? I mean, you thought you'd see every type of leaf arrangement in the world, and then you see a gold form with the uh, opposite, let's like say, party pack leaves, bachelor basket. Beautifully camouflaged <clears throat> amongst the coarse petals is bachelor elegant. Elegant is a widespread species, but this form of arborvita only occurs amongst the coarse petals. And just to get this is Thylacodon, Pygmaeus uh, growing in amongst Crassula hertipes, the hedgehog Crassula, understandable part of that name. Beautiful up close, not nearly as fierce and vicious as some of your cacti, but be careful not to fall in with your macro lens, otherwise, you gobble you up. Aerospermum titanopsoides, sadly, and also a species. Critically endangered, now highly poached. Uh, the most bizarre leaves. These aren't really very soft, these water cells on the surface. And I don't really understand why it has a deep shape or why it has all these sort of glistening cells. Perhaps it's channel sunlight, but there you can see the huge uh, tubers which it stores for its nutrients. And some of your people wear lipstick. <laughs> And I'm just going to whiz through some of the bulbs that you might encounter on the on the canal slots as well. Lapyrusias, Ornithoglum, Prunosum, Morea, Gladiolus, or Petaurus. Some of the curly wordies, sadly, these have become very short of the east of being poached as well. Tracheandrus, um, Gethalus, there's a Gethalus as well. Tocuma Franca, and that Tracheandra, Tracheandra. Polytrix, uh, orchid, Lacanalia, Frenzy, one of my favorites, uh, Lacanalia carnosa, Lacanalia violetia, Lacanalia minima, uh, parasitic plants from the foxglove family called Myobanchi. There's another guest list from the Amaryllis family, Ukuma A beautiful iris called Ferraria. There's another Ferraria crisper, with fantastic. Fragrance and, and this crazy leaf formation. Some new species from the area. I'm just going to end off now with some of the, 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 the treasures that we've discovered in the last few years. A new species of Trimia, only found in one single locality, um, and the leaves never come above the quartz petals, completely submerged, and that's probably why it's never been found. It flowers for four hours once a year, and that's it. Don't miss the flowers because that's the way the whole other year to see them. They literally open at about two in the afternoon. And they close at about 6 p.m. And that's it. Done. So, yeah, that's, that's limiting your offer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Electron microscope, a view of the leaf of that plant. It's an amazing how I think God keeps things revealed that are hidden from us. So we don't, we don't have to like we don't get to open books like this and print one on Christmas morning. We keep discovering new things. And like, like the heavens where we see, uh, we get a new telescope and we can see now even further things we can never see before. You know, we now can see things that you could never have seen with the naked eye. So isn't it just um, marvelous? Um, we feel very humble in a place like the sea. The glorious plant. Very um, honored to have uh, discovered this wonderful little Romulia named Portico by one of my colleagues. It's named after the quartz pebbles in which it lives. This is the new Othona, some of you who enjoy growing a succulent with geophysic daisies. Othona, at the moment, doesn't even have a species name. I think that's a good name. But a huge big potato uh, like tuba under the ground. This is one that was named just a few, just a year or two ago, in fact. Hemanthus humani. And that's my index finger on the right. <laughs> um, so, Hemanthus, if you know Hemanthus, they usually have quite big leaves. Did you go back to that last picture? Yeah. This one here looks like a moose antler. Moose antler, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, 
go. This, I'm going to have to find the Where to find the lose them. There you go. There you go. I love it. Yeah, caribou. 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 <laughs> there you go. And this is a curious thing, which uh, we found this uh, last year as well. Uh, I think I think it's a caroxylon. I actually have no idea even what genes it belongs to. But uh, there's some of the treasures and some of the field work that we've been doing. So I hope this has uh, inspired you. I do have an issue with a pulse warning. The bottom line on the cash flag that plucked is very bad in the back. <laughs> and uh, do be prepared to have your elbows and knees embedded with quartz pebbles. Um, but uh, I do have a philosophy, and that is the harder you look, the more you find. And really, that is so true. When you see so much of this height, and you get down, and you see so much more, and then you get even closer, and you see so much more. It's a tremendously rich landscape. Oh, I'm blessed with fabulous rainforest life. So, thank you very much. I'm sorry, so late. Thank you. Enjoy. Yes. Okay. Yes, time for questions. Um, you were talking about the non rainfall precipitation. Did that occur all year or is it during several times of the year? That's a good question. I, I, it happens all year, but I, I presume it happens more when, when the humidity is not high. Remember those, those stones? Need to reduce the air temperature to the low dew point, which is going to be harder. Dew typically is the readily in the hot summer months. So it'll be 